Today we have the pleasure of welcoming playwright and author Victoria Nalani Nubel, the author of many novels including Murder Casts a Shadow, Murder Leaves Its Mark, and Murder Frames the Scene. Books of her plays include Hawaii Ne, Island Plays, and Navigating Islands, Plays from the Pacific. Many of her plays have been performed in Britain, America, the Pacific, and Asia. Plays produced by Kumakuhua Theatre include Ola Naivi, Fanny and Bell, The Conversation of Kaahumanu, and The Holiday of Rain. Her work is in many anthologies, including An Ocean of Wonder, The Fantastic in the Pacific. She is the recipient of several awards, including the Hawaii Award for Literature and Elliot Cades Award for Literature. Victoria Nalani Nubo shares the authors who influence her work, her writing process for various genres, and the importance of research and authentic dialogue. Join us in a space for creativity. Welcome to the Reading Room. I love how you mentioned about, um, you know, feminism and also uh, that cultural uh, heritage and background that you can see in your plays and basically whatever you write, it, it's so strong and uh, we really appreciate you sharing your, your work uh, with us. Uh, I, I was wondering, do you have a favorite, because I know you have novels, plays, uh, short stories, you know, all, like you write mysteries as well. Do you have a favorite um, book or play or short story? And if so, why is that your favorite? You know, I actually don't have a favorite. I feel like, you know, when I, I tried to, I try and think of, you know, do I have a favorite thing that I've written? But it's kind of like looking at your kids and saying, oh, I, I love that one the most. But usually I'm um, most involved and fascinated with the latest thing I've been working on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just, I just finished a play, Aitu Fathine, that Kumu just produced. So I'm still, you know, that play is still like, I'm still living with it. And I actually just finished a novel that um, I've been working on for years. Um, I'm still doing the rewriting on it. And, um, you know, I just had this short story published too in the Ocean of Wonder, so... Yeah. I, I know you're heavily anthologized, you know, there's a lot of anthologies with your work in it. Um, do you mind reading uh, one of your short stories from that anthology? Well, I can. Um, I, I wrote this um, short story, it's called Auntie, and um, I thought maybe I could read just a little excerpt from it. And just to um, give you a little exposition about where I'm reading in the story, the story is set in the 1950s and um, the voice that um, you'll hear in the text is a girl's voice, she's about nine years old. And she and her family live in, um, you know, it's the 1950s, they live in a really rural valley. Her father goes pig hunting a lot. <laughs> and in this excerpt, he's come home and He's, he's brought a very strange um, looking lady with him back to the house. So um, I'll just start reading. It turned out Auntie was going to live with us. Oh, I'm sorry, can't see. It turned out Auntie was going to live with us and she was given the attic room on the third floor that used to be a playroom. Looking back, I now realize that everything about Auntie was strange in the extreme, and I can only excuse myself from not recognizing it at the time on account of my youth and because I was so fond of her. After my mother cleaned her up, washed and braided her hair, and dressed her in some clean clothes, she looked elegant. When she smiled, it was like the sun shining. She had long legs and arms, and when she moved, it looked like she was dancing. She pretty much didn't talk for the first couple of weeks she was with us. 
She only repeated words and watched and listened. We had a television set, and at first she used to spend hours watching, and sometimes I could see her repeating in whispers the things the characters were saying. She especially liked Father Knows Best and the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, I think because they spoke slowly and simply on those shows. Then one day she just started talking like a normal person, only better. I found out later that when I was away at school during the day, my father had a tutor come and teach her how to read and do math and stuff. And she learned so fast he had hardly enough time to collect his first paycheck. This tutor, or whoever he was, had explained to her how money worked. And after he left, she started asking my father about it. And he explained to her about banks and checking accounts and interest. Then one day, she asked him what the thing in the newspaper called the stock market was all about. He gave her a book to read, and then he took her into town to one of his advisors who explained things to her. Then she and my father used to have these meetings about money and stocks, and the next thing I knew, Auntie bought an MG, learned to drive, and my parents were taking expensive cruises and long trips to foreign places. Auntie loved to make clothes. She saw my mother at the sewing machine one day and asked her what she was doing. My mother explained about the machine, the patterns and the fabrics. And before we knew it, all we had to do was show Auntie a picture and she could make us anything. Auntie developed her own style. She liked slim, expensive looking clothes, the kind she saw in Vogue magazine. Oh, and she loved sunglasses. She had a whole drawer full of them. And she used to let me wear any ones I liked any time I liked. One of the first things she did after she got her car was to cut her long hair, of course she did it herself, into a short, sleek hairstyle like the one she saw on Shirley MacLaine in that movie, The Trouble with Harry. That was one of her favorite movies. Sometimes she would take me to school in her MG. We would drive with the top down wearing our sunglasses. She would pull up to the drop-off place at the elementary school where I was in the fourth grade, and I would get out of the car, take off the glasses, put them in my school bag, run my hand through my hair like I'd seen the women do in the movies. Then I would give Auntie a perfect Queen Elizabeth wave goodbye with my chin stuck up in the air. And she would always throw her head back and laugh as she pulled away from the curb. Auntie also learned to cook and much to my mother's delight, helped her out a lot in the kitchen. But there were certain things she wouldn't touch, like eggs or chicken or any other kind of poultry. She said it made her sick. You would think that having such a beautiful and remarkable woman in our house would have caused trouble between my mother and my father, but it didn't. Lots of people speculated and gossiped, but I know because I was there that my father was not remotely interested in her that way and treated her like a younger sister. My mother may have been uneasy at first, but she quickly saw there was no attraction between them. In fact, Auntie did not seem to be interested in men at all, although lots of men were interested in her. Once, when a very handsome man was calling her up all the time and asking her to go out, I asked her, if she liked him even a little bit. Well, Luna, she replied, looking thoughtful and tapping her lips with her forefinger. No, I think I just don't give a hoot. <laughs> and she burst out laughing. Oh, I love that. Oh my goodness. I love that last line. I, I just don't give a hoot because I know that there's a special meaning at the end of the story <laughs> with that as well. Wonderful. I, I love your descriptions and um, it's so vivid. Um, I know a lot of your plays and uh, stories, they have a historical context. I was wondering, how do you um, do research to make sure that uh, you ensure that it, that's, it, it's authentic and it's authenticity? You know, um, authenticity is something that's really important to me, but it's also something that's kind of elusive too. But you always recognize it when you see it, right? It's just really hard to put your finger on it. But I think that, um, well, you know, like my mysteries, for instance, they're set in the 30s. And that, that's when my parents were young. And I used to love to listen to them talking about when they were young and what things looked like in Honolulu when they were young. And so 
I think just, you know, listening to people is a really good way of doing research. But then, you know, um, there's other kinds of research that I think it's important to do if you're writing or interpreting history. And I find one of the best resources is primary source material, you know, letters, journals, um, newspaper articles, things that people are, you know, for kind of first person material from history instead of, um, I mean, general histories are important too, because you might want to start out that way and get a feel for a certain time period, but really, you know, listening to people's voices to me, there's nothing, nothing as informative as that. Wow, that that's so that, that's good advice. Um, uh, do you interview a lot of people, or is it more like stories that you've heard while um, you know growing up? Well, you know, um, both because I because I've done a, um, a lot of documentary work. You know, I have interviewed a lot of people and. Um, I, you know, now that you mention it, I didn't put those two things together, but yeah, interviewing people, and I've interviewed a lot of people that aren't here anymore, you know, like Aquan McElrath, I did a a couple of interviews with her, and, and yeah, hearing her talk about the labor movement and um, the things that they went through establishing that movement was a really big help when I was writing a mystery like Murder Leaves Its Mark that has a lot of the labor history in it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love how you mentioned uh, historical moments like the labor moment, la la excuse me, labor movement, and, you know, how you interviewed people um, that lived, you know, through that time and how that's very important. Um, do, do you think that a lot of times especially nowadays in our political climate, do you think it's important to realize the, the past events or historical events? Like, do you see a parallel sometimes with current events? Um, I do see parallels in history. I think we, we all do. But um, I think it's very important that we know our history in order to make really good decisions about our future. And I think, you know, I mean, all you have to do is look around and, and, and you see people that don't want to look at real history today. And you can see what direction that would take us in if that's where we went. And so, and you know, it's interesting because when my uncle first started writing as a 19 year old in the 1930s, he said the same thing. He said, you know, we, I, I just don't see how we, and I think he meant as Polynesian people, can make good decisions about our future unless we, we know our heritage. Mm. I, I love that, um, looking at the past to help us in the future. And I noticed, yeah, I, I love your main characters and they have a Pacific Island background. Uh, for example, in your uh, mystery novels, you have uh, Mina and, uh, and uh, Ted, right? Ned. Um, oh, Ned. Ned. I'm sorry, Ned. Uh, you yeah. have Mina yeah. and Ned. And uh, yeah, they're very, um, you know, you, as sleuths and they're in uh, that particular um, time period, I believe the 1930s. And, you know, yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, do, do you feel that, I know we talked about authenticity uh, in uh, historical events. Do you have, um, I, I know you use a lot of dialogue in your uh, plays. Uh, do, do you have, how do you maintain authenticity in uh, the dialogue or in language? Because I know in Hawaii, we have Olelo Hawaii, we have uh, Standard English, yeah. uh, Pidgin, Hawaii Creole English, yeah. Yes, you know, that's a really good um, question because, and, and I had to take a look at that really early in my playwriting career when I wrote this play called The Conversion of Kahumanu that took place in the 19th century. And so I, I had to write dialogue that kind of sounded historical, but you know, you want your audience to, to be invested with you and go along with it. So you can't be too stiff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I, I think um, I looked a lot at, at, the, at letters and journals, especially the women's letters and journals. And I kind of 
I, I kind of arrived at this way of talking that wasn't quite 19th century, but wasn't quite modern either, just because, um, you know, playwriting is all dialogue. That's pretty much all you have to move your story along. You have a little bit of physical action and your set may convey a certain amount of information, but really it's, it's, it's dialogue. And so, you know, consequently, it's kind of a rough medium. It's not um, luxurious like novel writing is. You know, when you're writing a novel, you can you can get inside people's heads as much as you want. You can you can describe the surroundings as much as you want, and you have much more time. You know, I always say or think that writing a novel is kind of like going for a long distance run. And a play is like the hundred meter dash, <laughs> yeah. you know, because you, you only have dialogue, you only have a couple hours to tell your story and it's a much more restrictive medium. And um, so dialogue is really important and, and how people talk too is, is very important because he, one of the things they tell you in playwriting is you want contrasting you want a contrast between the way people talk. And I um, think it's easier to do in a play than it is in a novel. You're liable to forget that, right? <laughs> Those contrasts, but in playwriting, they make a big difference. Wow, you know, I, I'm, it, your writing is, you, you write in a lot of different genres. I, you mentioned the playwriting and then the, uh, you're a novelist and short story. I, I guess if, if someone wanted to be a writer and they wanted to know about the process, how does the process differ? I, I know you mentioned a little bit uh, of, of how they differ, but how, how would you explain um, your different writing approaches? <laughs> you know, Anne, when, when I went into my very, I think it was my second playwriting class, my teacher, Dennis, who I love dearly, you know, but he was reading this thing about... Um, you know, what helped people write, you know, it was going for long walks and, you know, reading and sitting around thinking. And I, when he's reading this thing and I was thinking, wow, it sounds like that person has a wife, <laughs> you know, because when I started writing, I was in college. I had three part-time jobs. I had two children. I had a house and I was just writing anytime I could. And I think um, actually that was good for me because I wasn't, um, I wasn't one of those people who thought, oh, you know, I, I need some quiet you know, time. I need this space and, you know, and, and I think that honestly, um, if you want to be a writer, you'll be a writer, you know? I, I grew up in a family of where the guys were surfers. My father used to build surfboards in the garage and they, and you, you don't have to tell somebody who loves surfing that, you know, they don't have to go talk themselves into going surfing, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the waves are good, man. They're out there. <laughs> and, and I think it's the same with writing, you know, you'll, you want to develop some skills, but, you'll get to a place where that's what you want to do. You know, that's, you're just going to make the time, no matter what's happening in your life, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. And I think for be someone who's beginning, I really, I think one of the best things you can do is just to find a really good teacher. Mm, yeah. You know, my teachers made the biggest difference in, in my life, especially Dennis. And I took a wonderful class from Ian McMillan to, you know, so I, I think having a teacher that you, you trust, you know, to teach you something really good and someone that you can talk to in a honest and safe way, you know, that's really um, a great thing to have. Wow. And a community too. Yeah, you know, community to be around. Yeah, I, I, I love how you mentioned about having a mentor, um, you know, basically having uh, 
uh, someone uh, to talk to in regards to writing and you know yeah. learning more about uh, writing itself. Um, is there something that you would not write about? Anything that you would <laughs> not write? Yeah, you know, there's certain things. I mean, there's certain things that I just don't want to write about. Like I don't want to write about World War II. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I, um, I don't think I'd ever want to write a total romance. I mean, there's romance in my novels, but I wouldn't want to be write a total romance. And I, I, I'm, I don't really, I'm not really interested in writing noir, mm -hmm. you know, or the hard boiled detective kind of thing, even though, you know, my daughter is a crime scene investigator. So I, I, I hear all this <laughs> noir stuff, but I'm not interested in um, in those genres. And but you know, it's really funny what you what you find yourself writing. Sometimes it's not what you expected that you're attracted to, and all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, saying, "Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna do that." So. I think being open is good. I, I love your open approach because like sometimes I know writers, they're, they're thinking of genres and like, I want to be a novelist or I want to be that instead of thinking of what's within and just trying to express themselves and seeing what works and experimenting. Yeah, you know, I think there's certain things as a writer that come to you that just demand a certain form. I mean, I, I, maybe I've written like at the most <laughs> 12 to 15 poems in, you know, in my life, but I'm not, I don't consider myself a poet, but sometimes I've gotten up in the morning and there's this thing in my head and that's how it wants to come out. You know, it just wants to be in a certain form. So yeah, I think being open is really yeah. good. Wow, I, I noticed um, for playwriting, it, it sounds like it's a very uh, collaborative <laughs> process, you know, with the director okay. and the actors. And is, is that how you work when you're a playwright and you're, you're doing your um, creating your plays? Do, do you get feedback from, um, like, say, the um, from the actors as well? Or cause, yeah, um, my process for playwriting is that I usually um, write a play by myself first and then I um, I might have a, a tape what we call a table reading where people just um, sit around and read the play to me and I can listen to it in other voices other than my own and then if I'm really lucky doesn't always happen you know I think it's great for a playwright to be able to have a staged reading of their new work where the actors have a script in hand, but they, there is some minimal blocking and you kind of see it up on the, on a stage. And um, that's when I usually freak out and I'm, cause I feel like my underwear is out there in public <laughs> during the stage reading. And, you know, it's something that's always been in your head is now it's like out there. It's not in a book, it's out there, you know? So, um, and then um, after that, you know, I might do some rewriting or, you know, talk to the director about what they think is working and not working. And then, you know, if I'm lucky, it's, it's produced. But, um, you know, it is, um, it is a very interesting process to see your work go from something that's just in your mind and, and then on the page to people, you know, saying it and walking around. It's like having somebody acting out one of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And, and so um, I, you know, especially with this last play, Aitu Fafine, there was stuff that I saw on stage that I didn't even know that I'd written, you know, oh. themes and things that I, I wasn't really conscious of until I'd handed it over to a director and actors and yeah. Wow. So it's I, a very I, interesting I, process. Wow. 
I, I love yeah. that how you mentioned it's it's like you're looking at it instead of a playwright, you're looking at it as a as an audience member and you're seeing all of these other uh, parts of it, the actors, the director. And yeah, I, I love that. Wow. You know, um, I know a lot of times, especially beginning writers, but they, they worry about writer's block. Uh, do uh -huh. you, uh, what are your thoughts of, on writer's block and uh, what is your cure for writer's block? Well, if something's not happening for me, I just leave it. I, I get up and do something else. You know, I play with my dogs. I Well, now that I'm retired, I can I can do that. Um, and I, I just feel like if it's not happening, you just have to let it, just put it aside for a day or, you know, and however long you need to and go do something else. And, you know, it's really, I, it's funny, my uncle, my uncle John, who was a writer, he <laughs> people out, used to ask him that question about writer's block, and he's he, they'd say, "Oh, just think about mashed potatoes. Don't think about it. Think about mashed potatoes." And the other thing he told me once that I don't think I could ever do, but he said, you know, a couple of times when he was working in Hollywood and as a screenwriter, these young men would come up and say, "Oh, I'm just so stuck," and he would say things to them to make them angry. And they'd, you know, get them to like, what, what did you say to me? And he, then he'd look at him and he'd go, okay, now you can go home and write. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> That's so great. And, <laughs> I don't think I could do that. But he did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I was wondering, there, there's a lot of, you know, uh, like, like you mentioned earlier, there's a passion to be a writer and you know if you want to be a writer or not. Uh, what advice do you have for anyone who wants to be a writer? And I know there's different uh, genres. Like, what, do you what advice do you have for anyone who wants to be a writer and possible book publication or even um, having your play out there uh, on stage? Yeah, I'm a really bad person to ask that question to because I hardly know anything about the publishing industry, you know, because I've had UH Press has just kind of published everything. And and the things that that haven't been published by UH Press, people have, have come to me and asked me if they could publish them. So um I but I would I would guess that looking for a publisher that publishes the kind of work that you're writing would be really good. Or if you can get an agent, you know, I know um, some other writers, that's, you know, that's what they do. They have an agent who goes out and, and looks for them. Um, and, you know, plays are a little, I think, you know, you to get a play produced, um, a lot of people enter contests, they, they just get their work out there however they can, you know, during for play readings, contests, things like that. Um, working at a theater is pretty helpful. I think, you know, people that hang out in the theater world, they have a much better chance of getting their work published. And anyway, if, if you want to be a playwright, you need to go to the theater and, and hang out there and you know. Oh, that, that's, that's good advice. On. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of people, like a lot of students who, you know, have that passion for writing. Um, do, do you, and I, I know you mentioned record, rec, excuse me, um, recommending uh, classes for them and, you know, finding a mentor. Um, what, what, what would you do? What would you say if there was a, a writer that was kind of doubting themselves and, uh, yeah, it's like, should I do this? Or, you know, what would you say? <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, I, I don't know how long I've been writing, but I'm still riddled with self-doubt. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's just the general condition of writers. So um, I, and I, the reason that I recommend looking for a really good teacher and a mentor is because when I first started writing, I, I didn't know whether my writing was any good or not. And it was only because my teacher told me that my writing was good and I thought he was smarter than I was and knew what he was talking about <laughs> that, you know, I was able to keep going. 
And so I think, um, you know, if you can find a mentor, that's just, you know, it's, it, it makes all the difference. But, you know, the other thing is to just, if you love it, just take that surfboard and get out in the surf and try and stand up, you know? <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, that's a lot of great advice. You know, there are so many um, students, you know, who are, are influenced by your writing, you know, in, in, in the different various genres. And, you know, th thank you so much for all that you do to, you know, for literature and for influencing a lot of other writers as well so thank you for writing and for keeping <laughs> it going and for continuing to contribute can't to help the, the writing <laughs> <laughs> wow no. you know is there an Albert <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it sounds like you know you keep on going is there a time where you think you would ever stop writing or it's in you and probably not you know I um I guess I'm like 74 years old now oh really and I, yeah, and I, I, I keep thinking, how much longer can I keep doing this? You know, and I'm calculating. Well, I feel pretty good now. I probably could go another ten years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just gonna, I don't know. I'm just gonna keep writing. <laughs> so you know, and actually, being retired mm -hmm. is the first time in my life that I've actually, um, have all the time I want to write. You know. So I, I mean, like I said before, you know, I, I, have, I always had jobs too, you know, mm. I always had, um, I worked in the museum field for a really long time and I always had an, a job while I was doing my writing, but, um, you know, being retired, it's the first time where I'm like, yeah, you know, I can, I can kind of do whatever I want. Yeah, that, that's so great. I, so, I, yeah, I, I noticed you always, you also mentioned, you know, being a woman, you know, and then there's this added um, responsibility from being a woman and yeah. it's, you know, compared to like, uh, so, you know, a male <laughs> writer versus a, a female writer and it, it does make a difference, you know, I love that. Yeah. I'm telling you, in my beginning playwriting classes, sometimes I was like the only female in the oh, class, really? or maybe there'd be one other one. And I was laughing the the other day to my husband. I said, Phil, you know, those early playwriting classes I took, you can't believe how many guys wrote about the whore with the heart of gold. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow, it's a and thing. I, you know, I know women who've done research with prostitutes and they don't even like men. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh and, and the male canon in um, in playwriting, and still, it's still like super powerful, but there's so many more women writers now too. And, you know, there's so many, um, you know, other, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, this opening up of um, gender identification and and it, it's just so wonderful. It's like a whole new world to be able to include in your work, you know, mm -hmm. and and have it not be forbidden to write about. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, I, I love the fact that there's more freedom to write what you want to write, you know, and uh, and th there's there's a variety of writers and, you know, there's a, an audience for all writers, you know, so I, I love yeah. the difference in times and the more, more freedoms that we have for, to have different perspectives. And I, I love your perspective as a, as a woman and it, how it just comes up because I, I know back in the day where it was more like the male Caucasian perspective, which is just one part of the story. And it's not, you know, entirely yeah. um, everyone's um, 100% true, you know, <laughs> it's like, yes. yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when I, when it really, um, when I really realized that was when I was, I was working um, in the history field at the Mission Houses Museum. And I was, I was reading all of these women's journals and letters and all, all kinds of things. And I realized, God, you know what? We're totally left out of history. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. mm -hmm. what women were doing, 
you know, throughout history has totally been ignored. And they played such a vital role in in all kinds of aspects of life. And I think, you know, because history's so, been so focused on politics mm -hmm. and, you know, it was a really, it really opened me up to be around all that primary source material and to look at things like material culture, you know, and see how that was a huge part of history too. I think that, um, yeah, our perspective has been really left out and, and, and in plays too, you know, the way women were portrayed sometimes was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I agree. I agree, and I, I love um, the fact that well, it, it's hard where when there when there's only one perspective or one um, type of history that's been being shown, a lot of people might not realize that there's other perspectives or there are some other histories that we don't we aren't aware of that we don't know about. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, you know. Yes. Yeah. And I really think today that increasing that awareness is like super important to the well-being of our, of humanity <laughs> and our planet, you know, mm -hmm. that um, getting people to be able to look at things from multiple perspectives or to understand that, you know, it's just not this one way street is really, it's really something that's super important now. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, I'm going to thank you again, uh, Victoria Nalani. Thank Ms. you. Yeah, this Victoria is great Nalani to talk Newbold. to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Victoria Nalani Nubo, thank you so much for joining us in the Reading Room. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of the Reading Room. <laughs>